The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So this is about uh, evaluating microcredit uh, and how to do it. It's also uh, a methods lecture in some sense because it's going to be an application where it was done both as reduced form, IV, as well as structural. So that gives us this great opportunity to think about pros and cons, pluses and minuses, kind of what you, what you can get from one and not from the other. Um, and this is about a financial intervention. So we have been consistent in every single lecture in talking about financial constraints and financial modeling and talking about uh, policy and policy implications of changing the financial system. So this is an illustrative application of that general uh, theme. <coughs> okay. Uh, very little review of the literature, but there are two, three applications. Actually, the truth is there's very few RCT evaluations of microcredit. Uh, Abhijit, Esther, Cynthia, and Rachel did one in Hyderabad, uh, Spandana. Uh, and in many ways, the results are strikingly similar to what we're going to find in the Thai villages and even some similarity to Morocco. Um, what I want to emphasize and they do too, is the heterogeneity. So for example, in Hyderabad, it's group-based lending, joint liability, there are small loans, female borrowers, subsidized low rates. Uh, on average, to be put in italics, there's no impact on total expenditures, uh, but on average, an increase in durables in the short run. And you might stop there, and that would be a mistake. Because the really interesting stuff gets going when you start looking at the people who are running or might run businesses. Uh, business creation, business assets, self-employed hours and profits increase for, all, for those who already had existing businesses. Uh, their durable consumption goes up non-durable does not. Now the consumption part is similar to the aggregate, uh, but if you look at say uh, the uh, those who have as in a probit a high propensity to start new businesses in the sample, uh, they increase their durable good spending but they decrease their non-durable good spending. So we're seeing something constant on the average and going down for one group. And in fact, if you look at the flip side, which is not surprising given the average is what it is, the low propensity business owners actually increase their consumption of non-durables. So, so, you know, various heterogeneous impact based, by the way, on observables, namely current business owners, and unobservables that are backed out through these propensity scores, as in probits. So, so it's uh, unobservable as well as observable heterogeneity that seems to matter. Uh, Morocco, similar. Uh, larger loans, lending to men. Uh, no effects on consumption. Uh, maybe some small reduction in consumption for those uh, doing agriculture and livestock. No effect on business creation, but within existing businesses, 
certain activities were discontinued less often and the scale of other activities as in agriculture and livestock uh, increase. So again, another aspect. One, the consumption aspect is kind of similar in the sense that you know, maybe for these guys that seem to have some business impact, consumption might be going down instead of on average staying constant and then you have this kind of nebulous effect on businesses. A lot of people think of micro credit traditionally as an impetus to business creation. It's to allow talented if poor people to enter and expand but and also enter into business. And in fact, some of the early uh, micro founded macro models that we went through in class very much feature that that vehicle. Uh, people going into business who couldn't previously as their wealth expanded you know driving aggregate TFP. Now that's not to say those those studies were wrong. Uh, these things can vary across countries and they can vary within a given country according to kind of the state of the financial system and the overall development path. Um, but we'll see again in the Thai study this a bit of a struggle to figure out what's going on within existing businesses that's allowing them to be more profitable. And that durable goods thing, you know, again, as we've studied in the financial accounts, we make decisions about classification, but, you know, some durable goods are used not just as a service flow for household consumption, but also potentially used in the business. And if they're you know, a sort of increase in durables might suggest they're actually expanding the business in some way, not just, you know, taking it out in terms of increased consumption. Okay. Um, so in Thailand, it's the Million Bot Fund. Uh, it, uh, it was a government intervention. It was not a randomized control trial. Uh, And uh, I, just, I guess I'll deal with that right away. Uh, how are we doing an evaluation as if it were a randomized control trial? Well, it was basically a million baht per village. Villages are well-defined geopolitical entities, but they vary in terms of total population size. So all villages got the same amount of credit, but villages with fewer households got a higher per capita treatment. And uh, there are 72,000 villages, by the way, in Thailand, and uh, they all got something in the order of $24,000, $25,000. So this was approximately 1.5% of GDP. So you could easily claim it's the world's largest microcredit sort of expansion and evaluation. Now it's a quasi-experimental design. You'll see in the slides, but I'll say it now. You know, we carefully look at pre-intervention trends to see whether there's anything else going on systematically between, uh, in a comparison between small and large villages, and we can not find much. We've even gotten the maps out and used this community development department data for all the villages in Thailand and, and looked at village size to see, you know, if, for example, larger villages are near urban areas or certain uh, nearer to main roads and so on, they're not. We only find, you know, one or two variables that are correlated. And you kind of expect, if you're searching over hundreds of variables, to find a few things now and then. Um, so we're going to look at the effect of credit on consumption, investment, income, and we're also going to look at some general equilibrium effects. Um, and again, just for worry that I'll forget to say it later, uh, you know, if you v view villages as small open economies, and we have seen papers on that, then by intervening, you know, village by village, there's some sense in which you're intervening country by country. That's pretty rare opportunity. These models we've been dealing with 
take a stand on what might happen with wages, for example, in general equilibrium. So we can actually see if there's a wage effect going on over and above the potential benefits or other impacts on households who got credit. Households who don't even get credit but live in a village where business might be expanding would be villages given certain obstacles to total migration would be villages where the wages are going up. And, and again, that's what we saw in those first few lectures uh, to be the impact of the expansion of the financial system. Question? So um, I guess, ex ante, did it, did it surprise you that there was no correlation between things like village size and like proximity to resources or you know, sort of productivity of the average business in the village? Or well, one thing, it's a, it's a political decision, and they, they divide and subdivide villages, but they don't do it on a regular, you know, <laughs> persistent basis. So if a village were getting bigger and bigger for mm -hmm. economic reasons, then it could get divided by the government into two separate villages. Uh, so what, what is the measure of a village that you looked at? The one decided by the government? Yeah, at a moment in time, we have the identity of each of the villages, and we count the number of households in the village. So potentially, something that we count as two villages is actually one big village. Well, the, the real question is whether the funds could have leaked over to neighboring villages. The, the grant that established this village-level institution was for a village. Mm -hmm. You know, like downtown Crossing gets a village fund, you know, Beacon Hill doesn't get one. Sorry, close to home. Uh, There's huge incentives to not share, right? I mean, if you belong to your village, why would you want someone else? No, no, no. What, what I'm arguing is that I think uh, sort of agricultural or resource economics would suggest that village size should be endogenous to, to resources in an area or, you know, like there should be more villages near fresh water sources, like in, you know, maybe a thousand years ago or something. Well, but, but then adjust for population. Actually, I think your argument goes <coughs> the other way. Oh, right. You know, sure, that I mean, yeah. if villages are an arbitrary collection of people, then you might want to have the same number in each one of them. There could be more villages, mm -hmm. but potentially the same number of people per village if the government has some systematic rule. Yeah. Now, the government is messing around, but not as systematically. Okay. That's one comment. But the other thing is this leaking. Because, you know, if, if I could get credit from some other village and or, as we've seen with the informal kinship networks, get more money from someone else who is correct, connected to another village, then we wouldn't have any power. Mm -hmm. Now, we have looked at that, too. And again, you know, we've done the GIS, we've gotten all the maps out, and looked at the impact on, on villages nearby, sort of creating these sort of smooth neighborhood averages. And at least early on, you know, it, it, the impact doesn't spill over. But that doesn't say in the long run it might spill over, which is another interesting potential thing to do. Yeah. My Stacey. question is similar, just how if essentially villages could be subdivided cities, how you can consider them all economically. Yeah. Have I answered it? I think. Okay. Well, I, I still don't get why you can, even but if empirically. I accept what, what you're saying is true, but it confuses me from like an a priori point of view. Yeah. Why, why is that just seems, yeah. Seems oh, well, we, we didn't take it for granted and get three-fourths of the way through the study and then think about it. No, no, I know. You I know, 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 we, we like, look right yeah, away, and I, I would have thought my that. hunch was yeah. larger villages would be yeah. near the cities and, and, and the, the main yeah, roads and so on. Higher average TFP or something. There's a map in the paper, and you know I created these slides kind of too late to include it, but you'll be reassured by the map. No, I believe you. I you know, it's I'm like so you can the, rub your hands on it. And <laughs> some sort of that's true, but it's not mm -hmm. true. Like like you have some sort of maps that like all scattered around, and so then like the size is not, you know. So I have to just, I don't need to so, so one thing is that if it's really urbanized, like. So there's a limit, right? Once you reach a certain population, like so, the, just take care of some of the endogeneity. Like, 
once the population reaches a certain size, mm -hmm. like the government would just designate it as a, as a town instead, and it would, you won't be a village. Sure, that would take care of some of it, but yeah. it shouldn't take care of all of it. There should still be some variation in the, the lower boundary. Well, one would imagine yeah, yeah. that would be variation. Depends on how quickly they subdivide them and so on and so forth. That's true. So we just looked empirically and got mm -hmm. reassured. Yes? A related question is sort of who has the incentives to subdivide up a village? Like, have there been other sort of village level programs in the past, which might lead? I'm not sure who has the incentive, but if you predicted something like the million spot village was coming, you'd want to subdivide up your village. Yeah, so, so on that, uh, the program was announced pretty uh, suddenly right? and implemented. Toxin ran on this and implemented it very quickly after being election. So arguably, elected, arguably, it couldn't have been anticipated. Now, the, you know, the larger question is, why was he, if he was trying to maximize votes, you'd want it per capita. You know, why give a lot of money to a village where there aren't very many people? But again, in the Thai system, villages are thought of as part of the political system. It's village, Kant, Tambon, Amper, and so on. So you give it to a committee within a village to run a fund. And, uh, and somehow it seemed, quote, fair. The, the, it's great for us, right? I mean, these are wonderful <laughs> mistakes in some respect. It's a kind of a unique opportunity. OK. Uh, So we did that. Oops, I see. OK. So as I said, it's uh, part of GDP, uh, lots of. Yeah, I think that's supposed to be villages, yeah. not households. That's too low. Um, this I've all said, so if you don't mind, I'll just skip it. Loans are about $500. Um, short term, as in one year, typically two guarantors. The interest rate was higher initially at about 7%, although the village committees vote on those things. Um, and they allow loans for both consumption and investment, unlike, unlike the stereotypical program where somehow consumption smoothing is supposed to be a bad thing. All right. So it's my data, but in this context, probably bears repeating because it's unusual that uh, we didn't see this program coming either. We're out there gathering data year after year, and we have uh, uh, five years of the pre-intervention data. We're going to exploit that like crazy because we're going to write down a model, which I'll tell you about, and estimate it all based on the pre-intervention data. And then uh, simulate the model and compare to what actually happened. We actually have uh, six years of post-program data, too, which is, again, rare. And here, quite interesting. Uh, you know, again, if you're thinking about, which you may not, but you might be thinking about budget constraints to do RCTs and so on. It's quite expensive. Uh, and gathering the data is a, bigger, a big part of the expense. So you know, running a survey for a long time before the intervention and running it for a long time afterwards is almost prohibitively expensive, or at least you wouldn't be able to evaluate you know, very many things. Uh, but, but we didn't design the data gathering with this thing in mind. It just happened. Um, I guess in that sense, again, we just got lucky. We're going to look at four kinds of outcomes, short-term credit. Uh, overall, I might add, not just from the village funds, including, therefore, borrowing from the BAC, the Ag Bank, commercial banks, uh, the reasons for borrowing, although we didn't, I don't have those slides for you here because money is potentially fungible. Um, we do look at interest rates, default, and so on. Uh, we have consumption broken down in these annual data, by the way, into these uh, categories. You know, why these categories? Well, we had the socioeconomic survey, and we did analysis when we designed my survey. 
to see what subset of consumption items would best permit, uh, predict the total in the socioeconomic uh, survey. So that's kind of in the spirit of uh, Blundell and Pistafari and so on in terms of taking advantage, projecting to get something bigger than food. But actually, there's some interesting stuff with alcohol I'll show you when, if I remember when we get through these things. Income and production decisions is another class of categories. We have assets and income growth, even in the annual data, divided into business, wage and salary, and uh, agriculture, and so on. Uh, and we see revenues and expenses. And again, we have some ability to look at female-headed as opposed to male-headed households. Um, okay, what's an outcome? Why? Uh, for household N at day T, this is like imagine running, oh my god, a simple-minded OLS regression. Uh, the way people sometimes used to do. Uh, <laughs> So village fund threat credit would include the, the million bot fund. You want to see the impact, you know, causally on an outcome. Of course, we're going to instrument this. But the, the other things are these household characteristics. Um, uh, of various kinds, mainly demographics, age, education, number of kids, blah, 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 gender. And then we have a, a time fixed effects and a household fixed effects, which are estimated in the data. Um, but he, and here's the, the endogenous variable being instrumented. In, uh, and this is pretty simple. And we, we also have those X covariates here and time and household fixed effects, but, but we, for household short-term credit, household N at day T. But we've also got some dummies that kick in uh, in the first year and second year of the intervention. Those are chi's, not x's. Those are 0, 1 variables, and they're interacted with the inverse number of households. Okay, So inverse, that's just to get the sign right, although it's a parabola, so it's not exactly uh, not exactly uh, not mattering, but if you wanted this thing to be positive, you know, the, the, the larger the number of households, the smaller this number, and kind of the less you would expect the, uh, the impact to be. And then we have the usual, all the errors are uncorrelated with each other, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. This is 64, because it's my annual data. Yeah. And would you also do, or can you also look at outcomes in the CBD data and have, you know, all 50,000? Uh, we, have, we have not, amazingly, done that. Well, the CBD data at the village level, this is a regression at the household level. But we could do, you could potentially do things across villages to see whether villages that got more or less credit. So the spirit of it is uh, possible. Someone actually looked at the socioeconomic survey and had enough connections to the NSO to get, to get it by village. And, uh, but their timing was off because their first year is the year of the intervention and we have the pre-intervention data. But anyway, it, it's possible. No one has looked at that. What was the year that you got to? Two thousand and one. The the first year? Yeah. Two thousand and two. <coughs> well, why don't they have the SES data? They just don't have the years. I thought the SES go back thirty years. They don't have panel. Oh. Yeah. But they don't have panel afterward, after that. They do. They can. They did. Yeah. Well, we don't have to. <laughs> we discovered it after. B has it. Oh, okay. We have it. So, uh, so we're going to look at n uh, new short-term credit.
consumption, asset growth, and income. Uh, tried to do it pretty carefully. We actually did it in about four more ways than this, but reduced the number of, that we show. OLS with all the problems that you know about. Here's an IV regression uh, with all villages as opposed to, fifth, this is kind of outliers in village. If you think about that parabola, you know, it's kind of getting really steep when household size is really small, the number of households is small and not moving much. So we, we clipped off, took the uh, big chunk, but we clipped off the tails of small and large villages and um, dropped some outliers from the household data too. But the, um, you know, every single way we do it, short-term village fund credit goes new, new short-term village credit goes up. These are roughly the order of magnitude uh, of, you know, $25,000 divided by the number of households. So, you know, credit goes up. You might be worried, and like Esther and Abhijit have papers where there's this substitution going on. You get cheap credit from one source, you borrow less from other sources. That doesn't happen. The, the, in, in fact, arguably, there seems to be almost an amplifier effect. But, you know, more weekly, short-term credit goes up for sure, one-to-one. -one. And you can see it in the data. I mean, this is just like a huge spike in the financial system. It, and it, it didn't go down. That part doesn't go down subsequently. Yep? If you thought that going up credit would take the Fed seriously, could that be something like people getting you know, extra funds and then relending, and so you have to sort of multiply it? Or would that... Uh, it's true. One would have to... That's a good point. One could be just, uh, well, not to say that it's a bad thing, sure. um, but it, you know, the, uh, you know, you have these sort of combinations of characteristics of loans, and if the village fund committee has its cap, which they're supposed to have on the loan size, then you know you get one leg up and think about doing something. Maybe you want to go the money lender or other sources and lever up even more when you have chunkiness. Um, so this is because it's going more in one for one for credit? Yeah. But the, the more conservative way to read it is just one for one anyway. So it, it's not like a substitute for other sources of money. So, so when I initially looked at it, I thought this is support for Esperanza's kind of idea that it, you know, you have, if you can get over a hump, then you'll really want to expand or something. But I thought what you were saying is like, could they be relending to each other? So like, could I be yeah, taking- Yeah, he did say money? that. And yeah. yeah, that could be going on. Oh, okay. So yeah. that's, that's the convenient yeah. And I don't think we tried to take that out. We're just looking at the, you know, household N at day T and some village J and, and adding up all the short-term loans that they have. So if you only counted the loan and not the lending, if it wasn't net, and I think it wasn't, I think it's just gross. Well, not all loans are one year. There are loans that are like one week. No, sure, yeah. And you see that yeah, of course. almost have the like almost have the different lending, so it's really, really short-term. So yeah, that's why we did short-term instead of long-term. Consumption levels, other than the OLS, I'll come back to that, go up. Uh, significantly, asset growth in one specification goes down. Now, you know, I can't help but, but say uh, that uh, you know, we're going to have to choose a model. What I'm going to do now, I'm giving you these stylized facts, but what model comes to your head on why, you know, things like savings might go down? Hmm. Yeah, like a buffer stock model. If you're on your own, you're saving for these future disasters. Now you in the future you could borrow if you believe the village fund is persistent so you don't need to have so many buffer stocks. So net financial savings goes down actually. Uh, and we have trouble finding stuff with the capital stock, I'll mention that. By the way, con th these consumption magnitudes are very similar to the credit magnitudes. So uh, a bit naively you might say 
they used it all for consumption. Now, again, what model do we have that would predict that consumption ought to go up one for one with an increase in credit? Hmm? What would the permanent income model give you? It would go up, wouldn't it? How much? It depends on the measure. The shock is temporary or persistent. You would think this was persistent, right? So that should jump sure. through every week. But I don't know how much. You take, you put it in the bank, basically, oh, and, and draw the interest yeah. off of it. Well, this is a temporary shock, right? It's just one. Um, but this is, well, then you get the funds back and you lend it again, and yeah. Either way. But this is, okay, we've, we've, we we're missing it. Right. What's the huh? No, 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 I'm just saying, yeah. no, no, it, you got close. I mean, the point is the permanent income model isn't going to get you this. And you've got to have these credit constraints. You, you've got to be something that's generating hand-to-mouth like behavior. So this is a shock to the credit constraint, not a shock to income. So you should be like facing this credit constraint. You, are, you should be constrained and uh, in order to Yeah, this. that's right. And it and and therefore you're gonna see that this overall average is masking a very big differential impact in the population depending on whether someone's at that constraint or not. But even if you are not constrained, if you anticipate that in the future I'm constrained, so endogenously you will uh, it depends on the interpretation. Suppose you thought, you know, the government gave the money lump sum to the households indirectly through the village fund, and they just put that in the bank. You know, then their, their net worth has gone up. They don't have an obligation. Within the village, they are borrowing and lending against this, this fund, but the village as a whole just got a whole lot richer, and they would potentially, if you believed in the permanent income, raise their asset level, right? And then get the flow off of it. Yes? This is, how is it all being financed? Is it that something like? Taxes. And, but like, are the taxes mainly hitting cities and yeah. villages? Yeah. I see. Matt? Um, so I was very confused between the, the OLS and the IV because the, what is the, uh, the expansion variable in the OLS, I was thinking, must be um, credit per person. But then I don't understand really what the, what the, the instrument is, right? Because if it's credit per person, it's just a million divided number of households, then, then the instrument itself is, is it, one it, instrument of households. So there's a lot of variation in short-term village credit, mm -hmm. uh, both among households within a village and across villages. So we're identifying this through the cross-sectional variation. We're saying what part of the increase, in observed increase, in short-term village credit can be explained simply by inverse population size. Yeah. So I guess and the OLS doesn't do that. Oh, okay, so what is the, uh, what is it's the just a flat-out regression, credit on the right-hand side and impacts on the left. Uh, all, so all, credit, so, all credit. All credit. Um, and, you know, net income growth is positive in, uh, you know, three of the four, including the OLS, or two of the three if you don't. Uh, and so there is some impact on, on overall growth, not levels, growth. Uh, and this is by source of income. Uh, you know, we see a hint of profits, apropos the first two, three slides of the lecture today. Profits may be going up, and uh, wages and salary payments are going up pretty consistently. So again, you know, what that's all about, but I've already given some of it away. The, the wage rate is going up for villages that got a higher per capita treatment. Um, and potentially employment goes up. Yep. So is there a slide on the previous slide as well? Uh, I mean, I understand we're talking about bots, so the quantities are big, um, but the standard errors are huge. Well, the, the, you can see the stars. Yeah, no, no, I understand that. 
but yeah. Even in, I mean, even in the previous slides on stuff that's like the growth rates, the standard errors are big. Like yeah, yeah. The you don't get clear zeros and stuff like that. So. Wait, I'm not sure what you're saying. Yes, the standard errors can be big. That would make it tough to identify significant effects. Mm -hmm. But we, on occasion, do find significant effects. <laughs> no, no, I understand effects. that. I'm just quite, like, wonder if, like, my question was more about the technical one. Like, how, um, is there a way to sort of make them smaller? Like, I mean, I guess it's, it's an issue of ID and, and, and stuff like that, but. Well, you know, this is with clustered standard errors and the whole thing, so. We, uh, and we try to, you know, eliminate the outliers to see if that's kind of causing a lot of the, of the noise. Sometimes it does not, it doesn't do that consistently. Um, okay. We don't find much with ag uh, or other, other sources of income or livestock. Now, as I said, we, uh, we also have the, a lot of post data post-intervention, uh, even when we wrote this thing, we we're up to six years of data. And, uh, but this is, this is OLS, so you have to take it with a bit more of the grain of salt. Um, for example, consumption isn't showing up, because, even initially, because we're not instrumenting anymore. Uh, the probability of defaults kind of moving around, and it doesn't go away, and that's a real issue, and I'm gonna show you the default rates and, uh, you know, potentially, by the way, there should be a lag, you know, depending on exactly where the 12th month falls, you borrow one year and you can't repay the next. Um, uh, net income goes up, but it, uh, it's not significant after that. And uh, short-term village credit, uh, remains remains high. Well, what do I want to say? Back to models. You'll you'll get one. Don't worry. Uh, you know the world isn't static, and we just shook things a little bit because these villages arguably are wealthier than they were, and they've also somehow used this to capitalize a, you know, basically a savings and loan association within each of the village. So if you were in a steady state and someone smacked you in the head with something good, you might expect the adjustment isn't necessarily institution. All the dynamic models we have with frictions, PACOs, for example, suggest there are slow transitions even to some ultimate new steady state. So this, this is rare, this look at, you know, the, at these. Now granted, the model is going to be partial equilibrium. Uh, even though we have some data on local wages. Um, and there's a guy named, is it Whit Furfine, who, who has a study, Handy and Burgess had this study in India where the government changed the, branch, the branching rules and showed impacts on poverty and all of that stuff. But he went back after they published their paper and, uh, and looked at the long-term impact. And he thinks something like this was going on in India, too. That the so again, apropos you know, RCTs, well, no one claimed the contrary. But if you don't know what happens afterwards, it's, you're kind of left with the impression and hope that the program <coughs> effects, if there were positive, persisted. Uh, here, they're definitely mitigating uh, over time. Yes? Uh, I think we looked at that. That would be good to do. We struggle with the wage um, because the annual data doesn't mention it, me measure it very well. So this is the one thing that we use the monthly data for. Uh, and we only have 16 villages. So it's quite problematic. Most things we try don't show up because of the sample, the sample size is too low and the standard errors just kill us. But I don't think we actually looked at long-term wages, so that would be good to do. Yes? Is there a way to say to the CVB is any good? Um, 
I think when you sort of look at geographic averages of things, yeah, that it has, there are beautiful maps showing how wages, not size, but wages move as you get near urban areas and get near Bangkok. And uh, so arguably something could potentially, I wouldn't trust any one head man's response, but with 72,000 data points, you can, can do a lot. Fall for, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, this is a cautionary tale. I'm going to skip it. If we have time, I'll do it next time. Uh, that would be a better context for it. So I've been trying to clue you into the puzzles all along. Uh, in terms of, you know, in the one thing I didn't say was about investment. Um, and I didn't uh, I have mentioned in other lectures that investment doesn't happen very often. And when it happens, it's big. So it's quite lumpy. And, and we're going to want to incorporate that. Now, but the flip side of that is we're going to have trouble finding effects of investment both in the IV and in the structural model and the data generated from the structural model if we limit that data to the same sample size that we have in reality. But when you see the structural model momentarily, you can imagine you know, a tenfold increase in the sample size because we can generate as much data as we want and then we definitely get these investment effects. So you know, arguably one reason uh, still on the table that we don't see microcredit directly in terms of investment activities is, is simply a, a sample size issue. I mention that because, you know, people write reviews of what do we know about microcredit and whether or not it's having an impact. And there seems to be a bit of a consensus that at best impact is quite mixed and maybe, you know, non-existent in many studies and people come away with this impression that it's, at most it's all about consumption, but I think that's a little, uh, bit of a rush to judgment. I'm not saying it has to be this too. I don't have more data in reality than we have, but okay. So we're going to have this precautionary savings. We're going to have some limits because of those consumption numbers I showed you. We're going to allow default. It does happen in reality. Uh, and we're going to try to match the default rate. And we have income growth. Uh, that's actually arguably the hardest thing that we did. And I'll try to say something about why it was hard. Um, but we actually allow, you know, persistent growth in the model. Okay, so what is the model? Liquid stuff. Uh, is just your current income plus your return on previous year's savings. Now, this reminds me to say, you know, so why aren't you doing moral hazard or costly state verification or full information? Hey, we just had a lecture about that. Same kind of data. Alex and I showed that in the rural data, the best approximation is something simple like savings only or limited borrowing. Now, we got lucky because Alex and I did that after Joe and I wrote this paper. But it, it is at least very comforting that the best micro underpinning that we now think exists out there was the micro underpinning that was being used in this, in this paper. Likewise, I would not expect to get the same thing in the urban areas because there, Alex and I found moral hazard. Uh, was a better approximation. So here it's sort of this incomplete markets macro type literature uh, or development literature for that matter. Uh, Ratio swears by this stuff. Um, and it's in logs. So income looks like it's just a multiplicative uh, transitory and permanent shock. That makes the log of income 
equal to the log of some permanent thing and the log of some transitory thing. The log of the permanent thing almost looks like a random walk uh, where log pt plus 1 equals log pt plus log n. So this is the shock to, to permanent income. This thing is the shock to transitory income where income is measured in logs. Now, it's not quite that because g is this drift, this damn drift. It's 4%, by the way. So there, you know, there's kind of sustained growth, not modeled. Um, you get this boost to your permanent income. It's like TFP type stuff. Uh, and then what's this? So investment, you know, why invest if it doesn't do anything? Well, on the contrary, investment gives you a, a boost of your permanent income, right? Uh, so this is this decision whether or not to invest a dummy, and this is the amount of the investment. As I said, investment opportunities arrive stochastically from a distribution with a non-trivial mean, so on average it's chunky which means you may choose not to do it because it's too big to swallow. You don't get a choice about the size, though. If you do it, you've got to do the size that arrived to you as an approximation. Although, again, I've said this. We see this in the data. People don't do sort of half, half chicken coops. Chicken coop without a roof is not a coop. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Pushing both ways, so yeah. Um, are there like papers where the focus of the structural model is to model to model that? Because you know, obviously, like that's really important. If yeah. In Thailand over this period, there was this four percent drift for everyone, or maybe there weren't variations. It numbers. is important, and we're not. A lot of the literature we've covered doesn't. Daron features that a lot. What is it? Is it innovation? You know, what what is this technological progress? It, sh it should be done. Uh, it should be done. It hasn't been done yet. There's no, I don't see any intrinsic difficulty. Actually, it's more like a real opportunity because when you're on the ground like this, you should be able to see, and in my data, you measure the capital stock and labor input and all of it. You know, if it's real technological improvement, it's like, hmm, getting rid of the water buffalo and bringing in the, the walking tractor. I showed you a picture of the walking tractor. I said it was land, labor, and capital. Remember that one? Well, it used to be water buffalo, and the people in Bangkok, sorry, wit, still think that, you know, the farmers are out there with their water buffalo. Well, I mean, it, it's just not true. You know, they have pickup trucks and, and all of that. So that's my, my, my point is that that's real technological progress. And, and, and so data like this potentially could tell you, you know, whether it's really that or just something, potentially something else. Uh, it, could be, it could be better roads, you know, higher, easier access to markets that's somehow showing up, everything else equal, um, but not modeled. And not at a deep level. Okay. Uh, so here's the max problem. Maximize discounted expected utility of this household. Um, rho is sort of the related to the coefficient of relative risk aversion. Beta is the discount rate. This is as of, quote, initial period. Uh, Here's the liquidity. That, by the way, was the same as interest on savings, short-term liquid savings plus current income. And it can be spent on consumption or saving or investment if you decide, D, to do the size investment that has arrived. What are the state variables? In any, in any given day, this is true for every day, T, 
it would have been better, and I don't have it on the slides, to show you a traditional value function where you'd have you know, the utility today plus the value tomorrow. But this does tell you what the state variables are, namely permanent income today, liquidity today, and the size of the investment draw. So those are the key economic states that households are going to face. This is just a parameter. What is S bar? Here it is. Now it looks like you know savings is bounded from below. Weird, weird. Uh, well, actually, you know savings can go negative. That's fine. That's just borrowing. So this is a credit limit. It says you know savings can't go too negative. Credit can't be too big. And it's scaled by permanent income. Now, in fact, almost everything in the model is going to get scaled by permanent income. Uh, part of that is the permanent income. We wanted growth. And the way to get the growth is to have this expansion exogenously in permanent income. But the other thing is you look at the data and you see, you know, like investments are large for small households relative to their assets, and you go to larger households and their projects scale up. So it's not like you can sort of, you know, sort of accumulate wealth and, and save your way out of these non-convexities. So we scale everything, go to the other extreme, we scale everything by permanent income. The arrival of project sizes and so on and so forth are all, and the shocks are all scaled. When I, and what I'm not writing down but we do in the paper is to actually turn this into a balanced growth path. And, and the intuition is pretty much what I said. The math is trickier. We just divide through by P everywhere. So, you know, the, the control variables are things like investment, uh, sorry, like consumption per permanent income, per unit permanent income. And then we have to solve, you know, the value functions. Uh, now, these are the stochastic processes for the, ran the transitory shock. Again, everything's in logs. Uh, the permanent shock, uh, so these are log normal, centered around zero with these uh, standard deviations. Project side is not centered around zero. It has a non-trivial mean. Uh, with the standard deviation. And you're going to see a table with parameters. Not to say you're really memorizing these. I am, because I want to <coughs> go through the list when we get there. Mu, sigma, u, n. Here's a problem. Um, we don't. We do have a borrowing limit, but, and we do not put in sort of a natural borrowing. We let households default. They default in the data, about 18%. It's not trivial. It's also hard to nail down exactly when a loan is not performing because they can stretch out the payments. So it's not nailed at exactly 18%. And oh, yeah, so here's another story with a bonus. Uh, Econometrica requires the codes for any published paper. So you've got to give them the codes and the data, which is good. It's a good thing. Of course, when you're doing the work, you don't really annotate as thoroughly as you might do. And then when you're ready to publish this stuff, you're going to like go back over it and we found a mistake. And the mistake was around this default rate. So, so we actually know, for bad reasons, that the default rate matters. Um, <laughs> yes? So I actually noticed in, I saw two versions of the paper, uh, and they had quite different welfare calculations. Was, was that? That's probably part of it, yep. Um, well, look, everyone makes mistakes in research, and it's, in some respect, doing it over and over is actually a, a good thing because, you know, you get this robustness check. But, but, yeah. So in what? the data, when, when we say a household defaults, what do we mean exactly by that? 
never paid off the loan. <laughs> okay, because in most microcredit literature, a default is what we would call a delinquency in the, in the sort of developed country finance literature. Yeah. So you're not counting delinquencies as defaults. You're counting actual defaults like we just never pay the money back. You know, I have to go back and make sure. We, we could have put something like a two-year threshold on this. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I always actually go the other way. I tend to think of defaults as a contingency in the loan contract. The Bank for Agriculture for sure runs an insurance company this way, where they extend loans and actually even more than that, don't charge you interest on, on the renewed principal and so on. So, uh, you know, people are risk averse. Having these contingencies are a good thing. There's, there's a literature on this. Uh, other other literatures, but still, uh, we so we anyway. There may be other ways to do it. Measurement is tricky, but we decided to put default in. And what is this thing saying? Well, it's a bit tricky to read, but we don't drive people down to zero consumption. We put in some minimum consumption, no matter what. You're not going to go below C lower bar, and. Uh, well, scaled by your permanent income, as, I, as everything else is. Now, what is this other thing, savings? Well, put savings times P on the right-hand side. It'll pick up a negative sign. That's credit. Minus savings is credit. So it's liquidity plus the maximum loan you could take out, you know, and still you... you uh, you can't cover that minimum uh, consumption. So, so you're not respecting the budget constraint anymore. You get this quote, gift. Uh, and here, then here are the rules that happen when you default. You know, you don't, you're not investing. You're, you're borrowing up to the limit and your consumption is the scale version, permanent income. Uh, so let's see if I've done my homework, or you have. R is the interest rate. This is the standard deviation of the transit of the permanent shock, standard deviation of the transitory shock. This is new. It's a measurement error. We imagine that we see the data contaminated. It's a bit dirty, centered around the mean, but this is the drift term. This is the lower bound on consumption under default, beta is the discount weight, rho is related to constant relative risk aversion, mu is the project size on average, sigma i is the standard deviation of project size, and this is the uh, credit limit. And R, big R, is the return on investment that augments permanent income. That's also quite problematic. What we did was use these return on asset numbers but Emily and Abhijit and I have been working subsequently, and we think it, it not only does R vary in the population with some heterogeneity that we don't have here, but it actually is predictive of who's getting the money and what they're doing with it. So, uh, which may be another reason that we didn't get as far as we thought we might with the investment thing. But anyway, hopefully we'll write that up real soon. Here it's just a number, calibrated, you might say. Uh, and we're going to use method of moments. Oh, now a couple of questions for you guys, or one comment. Back to the codes. You know, Emily was about your cohort uh, in a class like this. And very shortly thereafter, she got interested in the structural stuff. The codes are all there, and uh, you know, I'll sh uh, not only the published version, but all the other things. You're welcome to have them. Um, probably a little late to do it for the class, but uh, it's a resource that's available to you. Um, and of course, in the end, it wasn't the paper with Abhijit that's still not quite done, but she used structural modeling in her job market paper, and she was learning it by looking at those codes. So uh, the other thing I want to ask you, I hope you've seen at some point, you know, methods of simulated moments. One yes, three, 
or yes, okay. Uh, so we're gonna. But those of us who stayed to see about 7.31 in the fall, Esther had a problem with that on your paper, so. <laughs> we, we know it's pretty well. <laughs> I mean, have you learned, should, have you learned should, something yeah. new today? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. What do we do excellent. in network conferences? Like, mm-hmm. All right, that's excellent. Network space? Yeah. yeah we'll network space. That's excellent. I guess I knew that. I'd forgotten. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm glad you know it. So I won't try to reteach that. There's not time to, today. Uh, okay. Another controversy. What to do with all the heterogeneity in the data that we don't have in the model? I'm emphasizing certain aspects of observed and unobserved heterogeneity in the data that is in the model. But we've also got all these demographic stuff. Now, granted, not everyone would do it this way. Uh, We take it out. So we filter the data, basically. We regress the household data on these observables. And... uh, as well as, you know, time trends, potential initial business cycle, i.e., this is one year after the the initial data is one year after the financial crisis, the whole country is kind of, so, you know, the controversy is, well, why don't you just put it in, uh, and I'm not going to have time this year, but, you know, I've lectured in previous years on Keen and Walpin and stuff, you know, so if you want to see a really, really long specification of what you can put into the utility function. <laughs> it, I'm not debunking it, it's a perfect. we kind of estimate it, but this is almost like calibration because we have earned interest, uh, which is interest times savings, and we have savings and interest in the data, so we're trying to minimize, you know, to get the mean right. Uh, the other things that are more fun, consumption, uh, decision to invest, and so on, is just basically uh, you know, looking at consumption uh, in the data, and this is expected consumption through the lens of the model. It's conditioned on observables. Liquidity is observed, and income is observed. Now, one caution, these are not one-to-one with the key state variables of the model itself. They are something like permanent income and project size, you know, it, relative to permanent income are the key state variables, and permanent income is unobserved. So there's some work, you know, to, to back out these, these uh, expectations. But anyway, you get an error, which is the difference between the observed and the predicted values, and you kind of like want to minimize the error term by choosing per, that, the parameter values. Here, you know, here's uh, a la Blundell, Pistafari and uh, Preston, you know, we, we put in a log moving average process for income. So if you're judicious about choosing log differences far enough apart, you can k- pick up the drift. It's really very similar to, to what BPP were doing. Um, and, uh, and that's how we get that G basically. So these are time differences in growth rates. Um, Maybe I don't need to. And then, of course, you can pick up other moments by the orthogonality conditions on the error terms. Assuming that they don't see something else that they, if they were to see something else we're not seeing in the model, 
And we're going to make a mistake with these guys because there's going to be information contained in the error. But we assume not. Simulating, what are we going to do? Well, first of all, how do we relax the, the borrowing limit? We allow that borrowing limit, that S bar, to move from one village to the next in such a way as to predict the increase in short-term village credit that we see in the data. So that's how we sort of calibrate the magnitude of the intervention. Uh, and the rest is simulation. We're going to draw these shocks over and over again and get repeated samples. We're going to have basically 500 artificial data sets any one data set is the series of draws of the permanent, transitory, project size, and so on. And you know we have the pre-intervention years. You can stop there and use the data and estimate the parameters. You can keep going and see what the model predicts over and over again. Not just one path, but averaging over you know, these 500 different paths. Um, uh, you know, why do that? Well, basically, you want to get average tendencies. You don't want to be so sensitive to the, you know, the luck of the draw in the first year after the intervention and the second year after the intervention. Because, you know, we don't know what the model says the average, we know something about averages. In fact, then we run uh, well, this slide really deteriorated through the projector, but um, these are the economic variables in the, the model itself, liquidity divided by permanent income, project size divided by permanent income, and uh, and what's going on here, as you move in this direction, there's three black dots you know, here. And they're kind of all fixing project size and varying liquidity. So these guys down here are bankrupt. They're defaulting. They, they have om almost no liquidity. They can't even really pay back their previous you know, loans. These guys, these are these hand-to-mouth guys. This thing's really curvy. Okay, so th these, you know, they're they're constrained. They're they're liquidity constraint. That borrowing constraint is binding. These guys have drifted into higher territory. They're not actually constrained anymore, but in the future they know there are credit limits and so on. Uh, if you go this way, you're basically fixing liquidity and varying project size. Now, the most interesting part of the diagram is the, the Grand Canyon here. Uh, and what, you know, this, this sort of pre-intervention, uh, this guy's sitting close to the cliff. He's uh, he tempting, tempted to invest. But given limited resources, investment would drive his consumption you know, really low, and he's not willing to do it. But then you have this sort of increment in the borrowing resources. It's like another. That effect on consumption, we've got these four. These guys don't move consumption, basically. Oh, well, let me get at the welfare stuff right now. So for them, this credit program is terrible. Why? Because we're not going to force them in default anymore. We're going to make them take out a loan at interest, whereas before they got exempt from repayment. So welfare goes down for these, these guys down here as a result of the village fund program. Welfare goes up for these credit constrained guys 
because they're at the borrowing limit, and that's precisely what this new program is doing, at least through the lens of the model. These guys, you'd say, well, they're not constrained. No, but they're these buffer stock guys, and they now have excess liquidity. You know, well, might as well spend some of it. So their consumption also goes up. And as I just said, these guys who drop off the cliff, so to speak, they actually uh, have consumption drops. So this, this consumption average that we see, you know, one to one, is this mongrel weighted average over all this heterogeneity. Of course, that we only create sort of through the, the eye of the model. Yes? Because before we would have sent him, we would have forgiven the loans, sent him to uh, minimum consumption C bar, and let him start over. And now he's saddled with all that previous debt, and he can basically borrow more against it at oh, interest. And then, paid off then. and then he'll in have to pay off in that. the future. Yeah, okay. exactly. So it's different if you was borrowing. The government exempts your loan and you stay yeah. in the house, but, you it know. It would be different if you were borrowing from a money lender who was, like, going to break his knees or something. Yeah, so, you know, that you could imagine default doesn't work like this, but it, that's the way it works in the model. Um, anyway, and then, you know, after they climb out of the cliff, you get, you get the, a repeat, you know, in terms of. So, you know, if you looked at. That w those welfare numbers, uh, it's almost misleading. In fact, I thought it was wrong for a minute. Um, this looks like it just, the bankruptcy reason there is region, there are these huge gains. No, the bankruptcy, these guys are losing. They're negative numbers down here. What happens is very close, but not very adjacent to that bankruptcy region. The welfare gains just, you know, rise like a tent. It's actually not vertical. It's just coming up real fast and then coming down. You know, it's a very steep tent. And that, that kind of, so these guys are really liking the program. And then these other constrained people, they're kind of liking the program. All these people are actually um, relative to what? Well, basically, we use the model to look at an alternative program where they just get a lump sum transfer. And, and we, we actually do this consumption equivalent calculation, which is how much of a transfer would you have to get to have a welfare gain equivalent to the one you get under the million bot program. And uh, another way to say it, in this region, the government could have saved money it could have gotten households the equivalent welfare gain without actually putting so much money in the village. But it's, it's very heterogeneous. Some people are tempted, and the abstract on the paper actually talks about it not being a great program. But I don't know. Strictly speaking, Pareto criterion, we can't say that. 24% of the population really love this program. For them, it's wonderful. But the, more than the majority, would have preferred a different program. Yep. So that's kind of a comparison to sort of just looking at people's welfare in the model, like not thinking about could such a thing be administered for anything. Oh, yeah, we're extracting away from the people who are financing the program. So there's all those tax distortions being created to generate the revenue to fund this program that aren't involved in this calculation. Oh, I was just thinking like organizational capacity. So like maybe one reason for loaning to each village is Maybe. Simple person. Yeah. Uh, and then I just want to say that we come back to those IB regressions. Two comments. First of all, you know, what do these coefficients mean? Well, they're, you, can, you can think about them as uh, impact of the program. But, but you know, that's kind of like... Uh, a funny number because it's it's an average over all these different people who got treated differently and had different views about about the program. So 
you know, we're lucky in a way that we saw this big salient number and helped us, you know, figure out a model where something like that could happen. But then with that model, we realized this number is not a uniform benefit for all the households. Uh, so the, the, in other words, a big advantage of a structural model condition on believing that you're getting the structure somewhat right is that it allows you to really look at the distribution of welfare gains and losses. Uh, the other comment is more favorable. Since we did those IV regressions uh, and I reported them, we can run, we can generate, we did generate the data from the model over and over again, as I said, and then do exactly the same IV type regressions on the data from the model and take the, and take, you know, so we're comparing apples to apples. Uh, it's kind of a funny intermediate criterion, but it is at least a consistent criterion that's used on the model generated data as well as the actual data. And, and, uh, and the fit is actually pretty good. So I think, That's it. Thank you.